you Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This is what we done started Peace and love, party people. This is Tyler Kwali, the BKMC, and the place to be, the MCEO. This is the People's Party. This is the world's best podcast, and I'm approved that today with another fantastic episode. As always and as usual, I'm a lovely and talented and funny and thought-provoking co-host, the best co-host in the podcast game, Jasmine Lee. What's up, Jasmine? How you feeling? What's up? I'm really excited about today. Yeah, you know today's guest. So you I met know him today's guest. Another guest I met in Jeff's backyard. And uh-huh. actually, my first professional podcast was on an episode with him. Okay, well, we're going to get into all of that. Today's guest is someone that I have only met a couple of times, but I feel like I personally know him very well because I feel like I grew up with his work. Mm-hmm. He's a very prolific actor, producer, writer, and director. He's face famous and voice famous. However you know him, I can guarantee you know him from somewhere. He is a co-creator, executive producer, and voice actor on Adult Swim's longest running series, Robot Chicken. His mm-hmm. career started at a very young, tender age when he was a wee lad. He has been in more movies, cartoons, and episodes of TV than we have time to name. You've seen him on the silver screen in Radio Days, Rat race which was on hbo last night and i watched it last night um the austin powers trilogy can't hardly wait the italian job just name a few he's also a staple a staple of 90s and early 2000s television with appearances on angel buffy the vampire slayer which i believe he was also in that movie for a second we might get into that greg the bunny that 70s show uh we just scratching the surface you see i'm turning pages here um he was King Kong in the Lego Batman movie, which if you ever seen these Lego movies, please do yourself a favor and go see them. Uh, <laughs> Family Guys, Chris Griffin, the voice of Howard the Duck and Gal- Guardians of the Galaxy, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, Mass Effect. Check this man's IMDb is crazy. If that wasn't enough, he wrote and directed a feature film called Changeland. And he's got some vinyl from the film yeah. for us. It was alongside his homie, Brecken Meyer, who um, was also in Rat Race, <laughs> which I saw last night. Um, he has three Emmys. He's funny, thoughtful. Uh, he supports me online, which I appreciate, ladies and gentlemen. We have Seth Green and the place to be on the people's Day. Yeah. Seth motherfucking Green. And that's not everything. Wow. <laughs> How you feeling? I'm great, man. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. Thank you for doing this show with us. Right on. It's a pleasure. Okay. You are from Philly. I am. Do you say John? Uh, well, it's <laughs> like, when we're talking about what the John is, like... <laughs> yes. Yeah. No yeah. doubt. Different meaning. <laughs> Overbrook Park, Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, Herbert and Barbara Green... Shout out to mom and dad. I'm also green. Did you oh, know yeah. that? Yeah, but you're with an E. With an E. Yeah. I'm, that's like the black green. It is. <laughs> um, what was that upbringing in Philly like? Uh, well, my, both my parents were teachers and they were very- Oh, wow. Um, both my parents are teachers as well. Oh, yeah. My dad wow. was a math and computer science teacher and my mom was an art teacher. Mm-hmm. They were good parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, they raised us really- um, not like tolerance, not even the right word. They just uh, raised us with empathy. Right. And so right. people were people and we met people all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my school was a challenge okay. um, because I was in a very public school, K mm-hmm. through 12. And uh, I was one of three or four Jewish kids at the school. Mm. Wow. I was one of maybe two redheads at the school. Okay. And I was the only uh, one who was named Seth. Like Seth was not a cool name at my school. So it was, wow. it was a challenge, uh, especially because I wanted to sing and dance and like do movies and act <laughs> right. and nobody at my school was interested in that or thought right. that was possible. Uh, like you said, you had a Jewish upbringing and the stereotype is that Jews are naturally funny um, with the humor being born out of pl- pain, a lot, sure. like, <laughs> a lot like black people. Right, the um, struggle. The struggle is what keeps us so humorous. Exactly. Uh, do you see the connection at all? Um, I definitely think that being raised Jewish made me aware of the potential brutality of human beings against one another because mm. you're raised under the specter of the Holocaust and uh, with the awareness that one third of the population could be okay with murdering one third of the population while the other one third just hung out and watched it happen. Mm -hmm. So knowing that that's a real thing from a young age definitely um, gave me a more considerate and empathetic perspective, I think, 
of other people's struggle. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I don't, I don't necessarily maintain any, uh, maintain any uh, theological uh, practices these days. Oh, okay. Right. It's yeah, like cultural. all my stuff is, yeah, it's cultural, it's spiritual. Mm -hmm. I'm less about the dogmatic, you know, follow these specific rules and you're gonna go to heaven kind of doctrine. That's not really my vibe. Right. right. Yeah. You addressed that a lot on Robot Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're kind of an themes. equal opportunity. Um, I, I like Our asking team. questions, mm -hmm. you know, and I love provocative conversations. Mm -hmm. And I still really believe in a reasonable civil discourse. And mm -hmm. we've lost a lot of that over the last five years. But I agree. I believe that human beings, you know, what separates us from animals is that we have free will. We're able to learn and we're mm -hmm. able to make decisions that are based on more than an emotional uh, a moment. That's right. Um, you talked about the Holocaust and um, the reason why a huge, I mean, I can't overstate how huge this is for me. Huge reason why I feel like I grew up with you is because you and I are the same age. I think we're born one year apart. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, Philly is similar to New York City. But you were in this movie, Radio Days. Yeah. And Woody Allen is absolutely a controversial figure. Sure. For many reasons. And um, but this movie, I grew up watching this movie. It was the type of movie that I watched on weekends. Yeah. Because this kid in this movie, you, were the same age as me. And it's Rockaway Beach, New York. And there's a scene uh where your character Joe yeah. sees a U-boat yes. off the coast. He doesn't tell anybody because him and his friends are looking, but no one's gonna believe him. Yeah. But that was heavy for me. Like Larry Davis in that movie playing a communist. Yeah. The golden age of radio was sort of the star of that movie. Yeah. And um, now we're in like the golden age of podcasting. Mm. Interesting. Do you see any parallels there? Absolutely. Well, I love um, the I love the radio as a medium um, mm. because it's so creative. Mm -hmm. Because your imagination is more powerful than anything you could put in front of it to mm. to try and explain what you're what you're seeing in your brain. Mm -hmm. um, and radio, what it allows you to do is use all these sound effects and use all the, these conditions to create a mood mm -hmm. um, that's even more powerful than cinema when it's done correctly. Mm -hmm. So I love that. And, and we as a, a species, we just like entertainment in all forms. And so listening to something that stimulates that point mm -hmm. in your brain rather than watching something that you can just sort of sit and succumb to, I think that's really, I think it's really cool. We wouldn't have expected that there would be all these outlets for stuff, but mm -hmm. That's kind of the promise of the future is that now there's infinite outlets. Mm. So there's infinite creative opportunities. Yeah. I was watching a bunch of robot chickens the other day to get ready for this interview. A bunch of robot chickens? <laughs> a bunch of robot chickens. <laughs> they're easy to watch because they're short and there's non sequiturs. Like you can jump in and out whenever you want yeah. in any season. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it was engineer I work with. Shout out to C6 Federico Lopez. And he was blown away by the sound. Which oh, I yeah. never considered. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm not an engineer guy. I don't hear the things the engineers hear. He's like, yo, whoever mixed this and what they're doing sonically is incredible. <laughs> and I would have never noticed that. Yep. So it's interesting to hear you speak about it. We're, it's we're very silly. Um, <laughs> and, you know, one of my favorite things, is, I love the whole process, mm -hmm. especially when you, you get an idea to go from like, I've got this idea to getting to the place where you're adding all the things to it mm -hmm. until it's ready to give to the audience. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite. I love that process. And every step of it is an opportunity to enhance your message or enhance your joke. Mm -hmm. And especially with sound, there's so many things you can do that your brain will notice subconsciously that'll make something funnier. Mm. So that's where I get meticulous with the sound of it. Cause you'll hear something like if somebody bangs their head on a table, the sound that you hear is gonna make you think it's more painful or right. it's funnier. So whenever, we were just doing something yesterday where a kid uh, gets tranked and then he hits a table and hits the ground. Mm -hmm. And the animation has it happening so quickly. We were like, all right, we've got to define this with the sound. And so we were separating these two sounds by a frame mm -hmm. just to get them like bonk put, you know? Yeah. Like to hit and then thud. And then we started getting into the specificity of sound. I was like, all right, do we have like a solid wood hitting a hollow wood object? And I was like, oh, find me an aluminum bat hitting a, a baseball. And then we listen to like the high end of that crack and put it over this thing. And so when he hits his head, it sounds like an aluminum <laughs> bat hitting a baseball. And just that sound is like, oh, if that's your head. Right. Yeah. It just makes you laugh harder. You did an episode of Robot Chicken where you dealt with this a little bit. And I suppose it was response to Scorsese saying that these amusement park movies are, these, these excuse me, these, these superhero movies are like an amusement park. Yeah. And it's like you have... Uh, I guess it was the nerd character. Oh yeah, trying to explain why Psycho is dope. 
why cinema is yeah is it's both of them sort of discovering that there's a middle ground right between what should be considered exclusively cinematic and a place for all of these very um effective storytelling devices yeah. in yeah, superhero like, movies when scorsese said that i'm like no shit that's why i go to these movies yeah of course yeah and and but when he's talking to the nerd character and he's like you know psycho is so dope and he's like he didn't even really stab her and he's like no it's the sound effects yeah Mm -hmm. Which is what you were just yeah. talking about. And the style of it. Like, you can... I, we as an audience, like, the the more the internet exists and the more you can see, like, the absolute underneath, truest, raw version of something, the more the audience thinks that they need to see that mm -hmm. to feel the feeling. Mm -hmm. But part of the fun of, of cinema or or making any kind of entertainment is that... You can be evocative, yeah, and you can hit somebody harder in their imagination yeah. Yeah. than anything that you could possibly show. Let's talk about the cultural phenomenon that was Austin Powers, because <laughs> <laughs> I don't think people nowadays realize how big these films were. It was a weird moment. Yeah, I mean, you at one point it was like the biggest thing on earth. It's pretty crazy. I was very famous. Yeah, you were very famous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like, couldn't go places, <laughs> right? Because like everybody, that's grandparent evil. to your child was like, "Oh, that's that kid." Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was a moment. <laughs> I remember I was the kid, kind of kid. I'm I'm very much into cinema and movies, as you can tell yeah. from this conversation. I remember, you know, I was I'm a kid who grew up on SNL, and I mean, I grew up on Mike Myers. I was already a super fan of his from, you know, other things that he's done. And so I was very excited when International Man of Mystery was coming out. Yeah, and it didn't do well, and it didn't did well on uh, DVD. Yeah. No, not even DVD. It VHS. was DVD where it blew up. It yeah, DVD. VHS into DVD. Yeah, well, so that it was the yeah. era because I remember I didn't even have a DVD player. Right. When this movie came out, <laughs> I had I watched it on VHS, and it's it was a the slim type, moment in, in it history. It was, in, in that I remember I bought a DVD player at Pathmark, and I remember the grocery store and the grocery store because this, by that time DVD players were being sold. This is how long I waited. You know what I'm <laughs> You're like, I don't trust this format. I like, I yeah, I don't. I was. It was like the Vax for me. I was like, Nah, I'm not getting it now. I got to work out the bucks first. I'm still um, holding on to my laser discs. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember buying a DVD player and being blown away. Like, oh, this is how movies look now? Yeah. But for a long time, I held out. I was watching my VHSs. Yeah. But I watched this International Man of Mystery over and over and over again. And I couldn't believe that it didn't do well. But then it kind of blew up in people's homes. Yeah. And so I remember going to the movie theater, and this was like a pop culture moment for me. And the, the marketing campaign for Spy Who Shagged Me mm -hmm. was like, if you go see one movie this summer, make sure it's Phantom Menace. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go see two... And I was like, yo, this Austin Powers shit is out of control yeah. for them to do a marketing campaign like that. So what was it like at that time for you working with Jay Roach and Mike Myers? And well, it was cool for me because I grew up on Mike too. Mm -hmm. And I had seen him uh, all over SNL and I'd mm -hmm. seen the, the Wayne's World movies work. Yeah. And I knew I'd been in the business so long that I was thinking about it as that. Like as, here's okay. a comic who wrote his own um vehicle mm -hmm. and then it worked mm -hmm. and then he's going to keep going on and creating other characters he did that movie um so i married an axe murderer yeah. right after and it didn't do it's great a good movie it is a good movie yeah. i actually love that movie Me but it was really funny it didn't do very well right. and you know how hollywood is they're like oh even though you had three back-to-back -back successes and 10 years of success mm -hmm. this one movie didn't work so you're in movie jail right. you're in movie jail <laughs> yeah and when he <laughs> was wanted to make austin powers uh -huh. They said that they went to everybody to get it financed, and New Line was the only company that would pay for it. Wow. And even weirder, it was at a moment of transition where New Line was trying to figure out what they were going to be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they had not put all the money into the Lord of the Rings movies yet, mm -hmm. but they were sort of looking at everything that they had produced and what they were going to give a, a theatrical release to and what they were going to release uh, just on home video because the costs are so disproportionate between them. And so I read that script, and it was real funny, mm -hmm. but stuff goes wrong all the time mm -hmm. in execution. Mm -hmm. And my favorite story is that I read the script for Carrot Top's Chairman of the Board uh -huh. the same week that I read Austin Powers, <laughs> and I put auditions on tape for both of them. Right. And I got offered both of those oh, jobs, wow. Wow. and in that moment, had to decide between... <laughs> Carrot Top, who was an incredibly popular and successful comic, mm -hmm. who was going to get his first uh, starring role in a feature film, which was kind of funny, mm -hmm. versus this Mike Myers coming off of a, 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 his last failure mm -hmm. in a movie that is so execution dependent, yeah. it could go terribly wrong. Yeah. 
And I was like, well, this one will probably be a more fun character to play. Mm -hmm. Because I was playing this kid who was dealing with the um, emotional loss of his father growing up without a parent. And I just thought it was going to be very funny. I knew that my role, I could make it very funny. And with the Carrot Top thing, I was one of two best friends who were supporting this guy and like trying to date Courtney Thorne Smith or be the best surfer or whatever. I think (laughs) he was an inventor, maybe. But lucky for me, I picked Austin Powers. Yeah, Yeah. That's a good choice. We just had Miles Brown here from Blackish. Oh, yeah. And um, he told us a story about how he had a... He had got chosen for two shows at the same time, just like you said. He said he got yep. chosen for Blackish and this thing that Kevin Hart was doing. Uh. And the Kevin Hart thing never came out. Oh, that's tough. Yeah. It's but tough because Kevin's such a big star. You'd be like, yeah, maybe right. I just do this Kevin thing. But he did the, they chose Blackish. His father was here, Jack Brown. And he was like, um, Blackish seemed more family friendly, hmm. which is part of the decision making process. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. During uh during our research, I rewatched the um Austin Powers movies and I was watching the spy who shagged me. And I was dying because I haven't seen Austin Powers as an adult. Like, you know, you watch the ones on TV, the uh, Spits or Swallows. Yeah. And I was like, he was like, what is it? Spit or Swallow? And I'm like, oh, my God. What the hell? <laughs> and then it was a couple of times because I was especially studying you since you were coming in here. It looked like you were like, I'm like, how the hell is he not dying laughing right now? It's like your face would do like a little... And I'm yeah. like, oh, he wants to laugh, but he's fuck, he's holding it in. There's all, the yeah, the worst time, yeah. Yeah, I love uh, <laughs> I love Scott Evil's journey as a character. Um, how much room were you given to shape his personality, and what was your approach as a comedian who was really often playing the straight man to yeah. Mike Myers? There was a lot of room for me to uh, shape what his personality would be, mm-hmm. um, and I, in this instance thought the mo- the funniest I could be is the straightest straight man. Wow. Because everything around this character is outrageous. Mm-hmm. Right. If this character is like the the niece in the Munsters, uh-huh. she's the she's the audience's POV mm-hmm. of right. like, oh my God, all these people are crazy. And yet everybody in the family is like, no, nah, this is just where we are. Right. Our dad's Frankenstein and your grandpa is a vampire and you know, your right. your mom is the bride of Frankenstein. That's yeah, this is what it is. But if you're if you're like, oh, I've got to put on my my school clothes and none of this is abnormal, you know, you're the you're the weirdo. And so I I I, I thought about Scott Evil like that. Mm-hmm. The real story of this boy <laughs> is that he was conceived in a lab and then raised by a bunch of scientists without any real parents. Right. And then his dad shows up, who's a freak, a global terrorist, and he's like, I want to have a relationship with you. And that kid's like, hey, go fuck yourself. So the more serious I played that, the funnier it would get. The more Dr. Evil is like, and the more I'm like, come on, man, this fucking hurts. Like, you're hurting me. It's just funny. Yeah. It's just funny. So by the time we go on Springer, and you've got this kid like, begging to the audience, right? My dad's crazy. And the dad's like, well, I'm named my testicles piss and vinegar. And I'm like, right? Look at my dad, my dad. <laughs> right. And you even know. better, you see all those kids that go on Springer that are working the shit out and they've like got piercings and they uh-huh. got their hair all dyed and they're like, you don't know me. Right. You don't know me. And I was like, let me be that kid. Yeah, you're like right. an emo. Exactly. Right. Um, you said that your Scott Evil was the audience POV. Yeah. And so it's so crazy how things tied together in my mind. So watching Changeland, your movie, we're going to talk about that later, but you have a great, you and Brecken have a great exchange in that movie, which I find personally hilarious. When he's like, it's like Fast and Furious. He's like, I get to be Vin Diesel. You're like, which character am I? He's like, literally any other character. Yeah. <laughs> and I am a huge fan of these Fast and Furious movies for all the wrong reasons. You know, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of them because of how decadent they are yeah. and how fucking ridiculous they are. Yeah. Like, what are we going to do next? And Tyrese is the audience POV. Yes. Because if you watch them, well, he's just yelling through the whole movie. Yeah. He's just like, ah, <laughs> ah, what the fuck? This is crazy. What are we doing here? Yeah. In the new one, yeah. I was sitting watching it with someone who had never seen any of them. So I'm like, watch it as if Tyrese is us. Yeah. Right. right? Tyrese is speaking for us. And in the new one, Fast 9, yeah. or Fast Saga, which doesn't even make sense as a title, right? Fast Saga, that's the name of the movie? Sure. What? Okay. Okay, sure. <laughs> they would just run at... Just, There's a part in the there. movie where Tyrese breaks the fourth wall. 
Yeah. And he says, yo, don't y'all think it's ridiculous that we do all these things? We are we're beating terrorists. He said, yo, look at my jacket. It has bullet holes. I didn't get shot. The last movie, we were, <laughs> it was a submarine. We were fighting a yeah. submarine. Don't y'all think it's crazy? And I'm watching it like, yo, Tyrese is saying exactly what yes. I feel. But Luda's going like, nah, man, this is just where we at. Because <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Luda Chris is like, represents Hollywood land. But they're in space. In this <laughs> right. like they're, they're orbiting. They like strapped a car to a rocket. Yeah. I'm like, why did you use the car? Why is the car? Because where else are you going to go after the submarine? <laughs> after Charlize comes with the submarine. Yep. And then they then they jump the cars. They're in Siberia yeah. with Lamborghinis on ice. Yeah. Racing Lamborghinis on ice. They don't even have studded tires. That's they, the best part. And they tell they say when Tyrese picks out they the Lamborghini. They don't even have studded right. tires. Tyrese picks out the Lamborghini and the guy goes, it's Kurt Russell goes, Are you sure yeah. you want the Lamborghini? Yeah, no, I want the Lamborghini. And I'm like, no, you're gonna have to drive that on ice. Why yeah. did you want this? Yeah. That's a whole different uh, universe of movies. Let's it's get back great though. That is the- <laughs> like a multiverse where you know where Tyrese is the right the Wiley Coyote. Tyrese is arguing with the Rock in real life. So mm-hmm. now the Rock and Jason Statham have to be in another movie <laughs> in the movie world. It's really strange. I'll watch them all. It's very yeah. entertaining. Um, and Hobbs and Shaw. Yeah. Did you catch the Italian Job reference? I did. You caught that. I did. It made me wonder if we're all in the same <laughs> universe. The universe. You're like, in the you're in the fast saga. Does that mean that Handsome Rob was just like going by different names? Yo, that's what they're implying. Do, does that mean that if I'm ever in a fast movie, I gotta play the Napster? You're playing the Napster in the fast movie. What happened to that guy? Is that guy the same guy from Enemy of the State? Different guys. Different guys. The Enemy of the State guy's <laughs> a different guy. <laughs> they're both like computer guys. Though, right? I played a lot of computer guys. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you do a lot of voices. Yeah. People who are super fans know that Dr. Evil, Mike Myers' Dr. Evil, is a Lorne Michaels impersonation. Yes. I am very privileged to have met Lorne Michaels. Once Dave Chappelle took me out to his house once. Yeah. And I was staying at his house and he was talking. I'm like, that's fucking Dr. Evil. Yeah. (laughs) It's funny. And he, uh, by all accounts, he doesn't acknowledge that. or He's like, that's not, that doesn't sound, I don't think, you know. You, um, we and Talib were talking about it because I was like, that's freaking, I said, Dr. Evil is Trump. And he's like, no, he's not. He's Lauren Michael. And I was like, oh. <laughs> but you're both, you're both right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Well, it's not based on him, but man, but he's a, Trump. a more apt comparison couldn't be made. Yeah. I mean. I was watching it and I'm like, yo, this was the last four years of our life was yeah. Dr. Evil. Mm. Like everything. Shout out to Vern Troyer. Yeah. Rest in peace. Yeah, man. It must have been difficult. It was a trip. We, you know, because I met him so young and he was so cool. And it's, I don't know. I've worked with all all kinds of shapes and sizes and I've met like all shapes and sizes. Right. So, and I've also had family that um, suffers uh, MS or cancer. Mm. So I've seen the way just conditions affect a person's ability to do stuff Mm -hmm. without changing the way their mind interprets it. Wow, yeah. And so for me, I just want to get to know this guy. I'm like, Mm -hmm. oh, great. We're going to be in scenes together. We're going to be comedic foils. Mm -hmm. Let's like get a rhythm. Mm -hmm. And so we just hung out, talked about music, talked about movies, all that stuff. He was real cool. And then we would work out like, all right, how serious? Like, do you want me to lift you? Do you want to like grab me? How do you want to do this? Mm -hmm. And we, we had a great time together. So when we got to come back for the third movie, it was like, ready about it. Right. In sync. I met him at Barney's Beanery. (laughs) Have you ever been there? Of course. (laughs) I spent a lot of times there. (laughs) It was a karaoke night at Barney's Beanery. And I went with a bunch of friends. This is like my first time ever hanging out in LA. And he pulls up in a Cadillac Escalade. And that blew my fucking mind, to be honest with you. Yeah. And to see him, see that little guy. Driving it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The thing's like custom outfitted. Yeah, it's custom made for He's him. a little like uh, Temple of Doom, Indiana Jones yeah. Temple of Doom, where the kids with the big blocks on the yeah. drive of the car. Yeah, and he came in and he did karaoke and he got drunk. And I, you know, I met him as a fan and didn't get to hang out with him. Yeah. But to be in that space with him was, was really great. Yeah. yeah. I think the last time, it feels like the last time I saw him, it was random. We were at um, <laughs> the anger management tour mm-hmm. and he, flew past me in a golf cart uh-huh. at the end of the show heading towards parking. Uh-huh. And I yelled at him, burn. And he said, oh, fuck, stop the, stop the thing. And so I hopped on the golf cart with uh-huh. him and we drove away. But the craziest thing, mm-hmm. there were so many people at that concert. Mm-hmm. 
we're on the back of this golf cart. And so as we pass people, they're looking at us. And just imagine the crowd at <laughs> like, the, what the heck? anger what the management heck is going on? show. And me and Vern are on the back of this golf cart just like. <laughs> 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 you said you met me at, at backstage at a Beastie Boys concert? Yes. Well, it was after your show. Okay. I was opening for the Beastie Boys. It had to be like yeah, 2003 it was, it or 4. Was, it was Quali Plus Friends, I ah. think. And it was you. It was Mo Steph. It was Common. It right, was and most really... was in uh, Italian Job. Yeah, so I had uh, good tickets to the Beastie Boys show, uh -huh. but I went backstage when you were on. I got to watch your set, and most of them I checked out uh, mm -hmm. or caught up. And this is my favorite story about him, because you know, you know him, so you know this yeah, is yeah. cool. He's in the middle of telling me something about something real serious, like Umi was here, we're doing this, and blah, 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 blah. And he goes, oh, shit, hold on one second. He <laughs> walks on stage and he like <laughs> and then he like goes bah! so it was like two weeks late and i was like hey, no 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 hold on hold on you don't get to just rap life Hilarious. you don't get to just do do that and he's like but that's what i do that's so, what i do that's and picked right. up where you left off it was pretty amazing so after that show we met very very briefly mm -hmm. And one of the coolest things that's ever happened, Common gave me his working laminate mm. and was like, I'm not going to need this. You're going to hang out? And I was like, yeah, all right. So they kicked everybody out of the backstage when the Beastie Boys went on. Mm -hmm. And because I had this working <laughs> laminate, they were like, everybody, everybody, uh, are you all right? And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> so I hung out just by the curtain uh -huh. and watched the Beastie Boys do their show. And it's one of the coolest things that ever happened. I've never met MCA in real life. Mm -hmm. But we shared a moment on stage because uh -huh. I'm behind this curtain and they're doing their thing and he does his verse mm -hmm. and then he looks and I'm there. <laughs> and he throws me this look like, and I throw him a look like, and then he's like, it goes back right. to the show. So cool. That's beautiful. That's Shout cool. out to Common made that music. happen. Yeah. RP uh, ouch. I heard, I hear that Mike Myers has a fourth script in the working. Have you read it? And are you going to repri reprise? Oh, oh, bless you. Scott um, Evil. <laughs> I have heard for the last, I don't even know how many years, that they're going to make another movie. Mm -hmm. And then it has not materialized. So I'll never say never. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody knows that if that came together, I'd be down for it. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. No doubt. I would love if y'all if y'all did the fourth one to not do any promotions, just release it like Drake. Because <laughs> when you have like a movie as iconic as the trilogy of Austin Powers, you like you're you're our expectations are gonna be like so high. And you know, so I feel like if they just drop it and don't tell anything about it, we'll be able to just celebrate it for what it is. I like that plan. I definitely wouldn't tell you if that was what was actually happening. <laughs> <laughs> you were in Buffy and Angel. Mm. Yeah. And this mm. had to also be a very like famous time in your life because that's like a, a huge cult following behind these shows. Oh, it yeah. was. We a, a little bit less when it was actually on. Um, okay. Like they were they were mostly uh, teenagers watching the shows, mm -hmm. um, but it did become very popular amongst those groups. Yeah. 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 And it was crazy for me because it was the first time that I had, um, I was playing a character that was arguably attractive to my peer group mm -hmm. that's not me like i don't play i don't play like the handsome guy i always play like the funny guy or the weird guy or the the drug addict guy or the dangerous guy or the guy who brought you the drugs or alcohol or the or the guy who like sold you on the plot to defraud the college or whatever it is I mean, you I'm get usually, yeah i'm the guy in the van you know what the i mean guy in the van. i'm the oh, guy who's building the, the tech yeah. for superman <laughs> right, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> but on Buffy, all of a sudden, I was playing a guy who like got to kiss the girl and play a guitar. So mm -hmm. it That's changed cool the way the audience was seeing me for a moment, which was funny. Nerds got cool in our lifetime. That's something you said that I really like, which is that uh, MCs are the biggest nerds. Oh, you read my book. I did read your book, oh, yeah. See, yeah, yeah, yeah. But just the idea that like we're – because I'd never heard it broken down like that. But mm -hmm. especially today, mm -hmm. like the current lyricists are – trying harder like we've mm -hmm. seen innovations speed and cadence and mm -hmm. rhyme schemes mm -hmm. and it's evolved to a place where you know everyone is just giving it but i love that assessment mm -hmm. that we're all nerds for the literature that we're all uh, nerds for the the written word for yeah. the spoken word speaking of spoken word and speaking of literature 
I read this book back in the day when I was in college, a book called Disco Bloodbath. Oh. And I recognized some of the people in the book because I was hanging out at clubs with Peter Gation and all of them, yeah. Jessica Rosenblum and Funkmaster Flex. There was an overlap at that time with the Peter Gation clubs, yeah. with the hip hop clubs and the more like dance. What would become the ballroom right. kind of scene, yeah. Um, that book became the basis of Party Monster. Yeah. Um, which you were in. Macaulay Coughlin is fantastic in this movie. Um, his name keeps coming up on this show. We need to have um, We do. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It also featured Chloe Sevigny, who was somebody I hung out with a lot as yeah. a teenager. Before before any of us did anything, around the time when she was doing like kids, yeah. I was hanging out. Did you know DJ JMS? Uh-uh. JMS is who I met Chloe through. He passed away a couple years ago. Hmm. Really influential person in my life. Um, uh, but you played DJ James St. James, um, talk to us about doing that role. Oh, man. Um, well, you know, I love acting. And um, one of my favorite things to do is, um, I hope this doesn't sound obnoxious. I heard Denzel, when Fences came out, <clears throat> say that he didn't think of himself as an actor. He's in the service industry. Oh. He's in service to the truth of these characters. Mm. That really landed with me. Because especially when I got the, the chance to play somebody like James, mm -hmm. I wanted to not do a parody of this person. I wanted to represent why this person is significant and worthy of um, uh, commemorating. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, James is such a big personality that it would be really easy to go in all that direction of just parody. But I worked diligently to try and represent the truth of him. And part of that was reading the book. And um, th that was one of those things. I, I couldn't believe it came to me. Mm. I rarely get offered stuff, especially stuff that I want to do. Mm -hmm. And those directors, uh, Randy and Fenton, the guys who had directed the documentary, they had followed the club kids in earnest and had hundreds of hours of footage that had become the, uh, the documentary they made, mm -hmm. which I think was called, I think the, the, same, the, same, I think the doc is called Party Monsters the same, same name, yeah. Yeah, so when they approached me about playing this role, they said that they wanted to get Mac to play um, uh, Michael Alleg. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I, we had just met uh, a couple months before and had a real good connection because I loved that kid yeah. growing up, obviously, and watched him from a distance, but we never really got to hang out. Mm -hmm. And then we met, weirdly enough, backstage at SNL. Mm -hmm. And we're just like, oh, I like you. Right. And so then they came to me and were like, we want you to play this character and we want Mac to play this character. I was like, uh, okay. Yeah. So I read the book, I watched the doc, and I was like, I will absolutely do this. Mm -hmm. We spent the next two years developing it. With, with me and Mac, like, never quite committing to it. Mm -hmm. But it was it was an amazing experience. It's probably the hardest I've worked on any role. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the way that we were doing it, because we shot it in about three weeks. Mm -hmm. We had to work 16, 18-hour days. Mm -hmm. We had to, like, run. It was frenetic, like how a club kid would move, though. Yeah, well, that was it. It kept mm -hmm. us in the space where we weren't sleeping a lot. Mm -hmm. We were able to keep our bodies in the right shape. But Mac and I were so focused on the work. And especially because it's an independent movie. Mm -hmm. And you you know this, you're you're a leader. Like when you step into a place where everyone is looking to you for tone, for example, for work ethic, you gotta fucking bring it. Yeah. And that's that's what we were committed to. We both knew this was a huge opportunity. Mac hadn't made a movie in like eight years, so even him getting on film was yeah. a big deal. I was coming off of like a, Richie Rich was his last movie yeah. before that movie. Yeah. But he uh, I love that he's he's a little out there and sharing his truth with people now, but he's very he's kept incredibly um, close to the vest because mm -hmm. people have been so pursuant of facts or details about him right. mm -hmm. to to a point where it's like hey, 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 and and he doesn't even need to. I said I said one time that he could he could not leave his house for two straight years and be more relevant than anyone in this <laughs> right, room. Right, right. Because that's just the facts about him. He's an icon on a different level. And it's mm -hmm. because of his performance as a child. It was yeah. so iconic that it just, we still, we hold on to it. Yeah, and it's this also strange thing that culture starts to adopt where, um, you know, everybody meets him at, when they're a kid. They see Home Alone and they're, they, they find that wish fulfillment of mm -hmm. what they would do if they were in that situation. Yeah. And then when they get a little older, they learn about Macaulay Culkin, the actor, the richest boy in the world who mm -hmm. became, you know, this mm -hmm. icon, best friend of Michael Jackson and sitting next right. to Elizabeth Taylor. And they can't, most humans can't reconcile the idea of a kid who's that successful and wealthy growing up to be healthy and well-adjusted mm. yeah. because we've had the VH1 behind the music story over and over and the the mythos of the the failed child actor turned to drugs and right. you know violence or whatever else and Max just none of those things he's um 
So I, I like that. So us making that movie together, we took it very, very seriously. Yeah. And uh, went home every night because we had hundreds of hours of footage of these actual people. We watched any tape, them on Donahue, then on them at the clubs, them in their own home movies, studied that relentlessly until we felt confident that we were emulating them on screen. Yeah, man, it's a brilliant performance all around. Oh, thanks. One of my favorite shows of all time. Oh, me too. Family Guy. Yes. Oh, right on. I'm sure this is everyone's favorite show. Oh, yeah. Show. I mean, that was on board from day one. I'm like yeah. a day one Fox TV, day one Family Guy. Right on. And I remember when it got canceled. I was like, what the fuck? How did this get canceled? And yeah. it blew up again on Adult Swim, got picked up again. It's a very ubiquitous, you know, this is... Who else has this happened to? How is does this, that happen? How does it happen? I've never heard of this happening. Yeah. Right. A show being canceled for three years and then coming back to go on for 20 seasons? Because it's that good? They was like, what? hold on, we made a mistake. We need that right. back. But I, I just, the, it feels like an alt reality. If ever there's an argument for the sim theory, it's that Family Guy is still on the air. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, I mean, Family Guy... It, Sorry, go, go on. <laughs> you get emotional about Family Guy. I do. Well, because we used to watch it as a family. And, you know. Oh, I, you I, didn't get those jokes either when you were little? It's a very I dirty show. Know. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. I probably should very go dirty. back and watch the first two seasons. It's very, it's out there. Do, it is out it, there. Do the, do the jokes ever go too far for you? There are times when there are personal attacks on individuals where I'm like, ah, oh, come on. Guys. <laughs> come on, right. what are we doing? Yeah, what are you, why'd you say that? <laughs> oh, she, she can't help that. Come on. <laughs> right. oh, he, he, he didn't know that that was it. Let him, let him go, guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? But other than that, I love the cultural, political. Right, right, right. I love just the madcap kind of borderline farce nature of it. It's so silly. And it's for us. It's for people who grew up on pop culture. I mean, yeah. you have to have literally like been watching the A-Team when it was on Right. Tuesdays on ABC to get some of these jokes. To get some of these jokes. Some of these jokes, yeah. yeah. Well, but I think that's okay, too. That was the thing that we decided about Robot Chicken really early on. We were like, well, if there's a joke that maybe five people are going to get, then maybe we'll only make like it like six you, or seven seconds long. If you and had if the Darth a joke, Vader helmet action figure case, yes. you're getting all these jokes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But also, Which I had. But if you're the one that had the um, single-run test gold-plated Darth Vader case while they were testing the C-3PO case, <laughs> then there's a joke that's two seconds long for just you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I had none of, none of the Darth Vaders. But, um, th and not only that, it's just like Family Guy has so many iconic things that you could just like... <sighs> <laughs> and everyone's just gonna go along with it or the mama, mama like it's just like it's so many things that you could just say and it's everyone will drop what they're doing and, and, and finish up the, the yeah. bit uh, Chris Griffin's voice is essentially an impression of Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs that's where it started yeah talking in a McDonald's speaker uh, explain how you developed that character <laughs> well it sounds it sounds so intentional now um, but at the time I had been, uh, so I got to audition for Family Guy when Can't Hardly Wait came out. Oh. And one of the other actors, Charlie Corsmo, mm -hmm. was staying at my apartment while he was in town to do the junket. Mm -hmm. And so we just hung out all week together and made each other laugh. Mm -hmm. And one of the riffs that we got uh, into was Buffalo Bill and how did that guy earn a living, <laughs> you know? So you've got this guy who's like, oh, I remember, we see, we see a great big fat person. <laughs> it, it puts the lotion on his skin or it gets the hose again. And I was like, oh, this guy, how's this guy going to get a job anywhere else? Is he like, oh, I'm sorry to bother you. Are you happy with your premium insurance services? Um, and then we started positing like, because we went to KFC or did a bunch of drive through And when they come on the thing, they're like, Oh, would you like a truck, 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 truck sandwich? And you're just like, oh, what if that was Buffalo Bill? <laughs> and he's just like, oh, do, do you want a large? Do you want to double up the French fries? And it just, I don't know, it kept us rolling the whole week. So then when I went into audition for this, which I thought was one of the funniest scripts I'd read in a long time, I was like, man, I want this job. Right. They have the drawing for the kid, and he's like a surfer dude. Mm -hmm. And I go, wow, what are people doing? <laughs> and they were like, ah, do, do whatever. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, down, I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. And they were like, great, great, great. And I go, hey, can I try something? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is a thing, but right. did you ever see Silence of the Lambs? <laughs> <laughs> what if it was this guy? <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, oh, that's funny. You want to try and make him younger? So I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I got the job. So that, <laughs> that 26. Never, 
that just never later. happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I right. You, you've been doing that voice for like 20 years. <laughs> how crazy. I didn't realize how old Family Guy is because Can't Hardly Wait is pretty old. Pretty damn and old. And also, you're on like so many different things that repeat on the regular basis because Can't yeah. Hardly Wait was like the teen movie they played mm-hmm. every weekend. That's the funny thing that I realized uh, when I was in my 30s is that because I started so young and because I've been lucky enough to work consistently, there's generations of people who know me from a single thing at a point in my career that is, you know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. But all these these different, I like that the audience has all these points of connection to me. It feels, it feels cool. Yeah. It's like six degrees of separation of Seth Green. Yes. Yes. And also I've worked directly with Kevin Bacon. So now I'm a conduit. So if anyone needs a direct conduit to Kevin Bacon, I just want to let you know you are one degree away by working with me. (laughs) Thank you, Seth. We appreciate you. Um, (laughs) You've read my book. So in a chapter about Kanye West, one of my favorite people, I uh, talk about Seth MacFarlane. Yeah. And I quote Seth MacFarlane and I say, I am not the hero. I'm the guy in the crowd making fun of the hero's shirt. Yeah. Such an excellent quote. Yeah. Um, what can you tell us about working with Seth MacFarlane and his ability to speak his truth to power? You know, we met so early on um, when he had been an animator and a voiceover talent that sold this show. Mm-hmm. And um, we got to do an interesting amount of growing up together mm-hmm. uh, just because... I was his friend when his first big show was on the air and also got canceled. Um, And during that time when the show was off the air, we lived on the same block. So we'd just like hang out, watch Logan's Run or like- Logan's Run. Talk talk smack or whatever. It was really, it was was good. He, um, I think has only become more confident in speaking his truth, uh, regardless of how controversial it'll be. Mm -hmm. And he has demonstrated over all the time that he's been working, just how immeasurably talented he is, mm-hmm. um, how born to this he is. So it's it's cool now. I feel like he's he like doesn't... the greatest showman. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but he's also shockingly talented. Yeah, like to the point where he can sing and speak at all yeah. ranges of the the octave scale, and plus he can uh, play piano yeah, by yeah. ear. He's a very prolific composer like those ah, songs cool, family man. guy are just like i mean I've, i'm Great. a family guy nerd i've watched like the the live specials yeah with alex borstein and yeah. like them singing and doing the bits and yeah. i'm like this is you know, the whole orchestra it's some other shit but that's the type of guy he is he's really dedicated to giving the audience the experience that he himself would love no let's yeah. talk about stewie the evil genius <laughs> <laughs> why is it that brian is the only one that can hear him Oh man, there's so much like canonical debate about who hears the baby or how they hear the baby. I think it kind of depends on the episode. Right. <laughs> um, but, but the argument is that, y- you know, there's some sort of leeway in the fact that Brian's a dog and most humans can hear him, but also it might just sound like bark, bark, bark. Mm-hmm. So kind of the same theory with Stewie. And why does he hate um, his mother? I think that's natural, you know? Look at any girl... From the age of 12 to 25, there's a definitive period where she's like, I hate my mom. Mm-hmm. Any any boy from like the point they realize like, oh, I'm almost as tall as my dad. Like you start to think <laughs> my dad's not so tough. I bet I could take him. Like yeah. that's just that's just growing up. My son Melanie is like that self. with me except with raps. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Trying to write better. <laughs> no. Like, look, yeah. I did a song on my son the other day. And I, you know, this rhyme scheme I have on this song is very impressive. And I was like, my son, you son, go ahead and kick your little bars after. And he was like, he heard this one rhyme scheme I did. And he said to me, he said, okay, I understand the mission. And then he went and barred me out <laughs> and did my rhyme scheme better than I did, but like with way more bars. Damn. I was like, what the fuck? You wasn't supposed to do that. Were That's you like kinda... when your son beat you at basketball for the first time. But were you kind of like, oh shit. My mouth was agape <laughs> the whole time listening to this verse. I was like, whoa. Amani. That's got to feel good. Yeah, it did feel creative. good. It yeah. Good. It's like, um, you know, the first year the X Games happened, people were going nuts over a 360. And then right. 20 years later, people are like dropping in from a yeah. Zeppelin. It's it's crazy. That you happens can't... in B-boy at competitions as well. Yes. <laughs> like, he just like, steps up, right? What the fuck right? are you doing? Right. Um, why the beef with the monkey? <laughs> 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 What's going on with the monkey? Um, I don't think there's any real original reason for that it was just like a weird non sequitur that the writers thought was hilarious Uh that there was some 
secret conflict that Chris had that he couldn't share with anybody uh-huh. that made him afraid to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and he tried to explain it. Right. No one would look because there was a monkey. And so he's like, <laughs> no one understood. I don't know. That floored me. <laughs> it's great. Now, you and I, being the same age, we grew up on the same action figures. Yeah. And we were the first generation to grow up with toy tie-ins to big budget movies. Right. You know, and it's like, I think that really tainted us maybe and shaped us in many ways. Well, there's a, there's a funny thing because there's, I like, I don't mind the global commercialization of an event, mm-hmm. right? But there were definitely pushes towards action figures that didn't warrant them. Like, yeah. I don't know why we needed a mash line of action <laughs> right. figures. Who's buying the love boat toys? <laughs> like, I just didn't get that. But so it used to that, be. There's no ro- robot chicken, right? 100%. Yeah. Right. There used to be a real barometer for getting a toy, and now, like, everybody can get one, which is kind of amazing. You had that uh, that Public Enemy 4-pack in your lobby. Yeah. I bought that when it came out. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I know these roads. <laughs> I navigate these roads very well. Yeah. All the greatest TV comedy shows do a Star Wars episode. Mm-hmm. Now, yours... It's one of the best. Oh, thanks. And you, George Lucas, Mark Hamill, Billy D. Williams are all in this Robot Chicken series of- Yeah, right? I mean, that's f- fucking crazy. How are you able to pull this off? Yeah, I don't know. You don't know? We, <laughs> you know, it was just sort of step by step. And it's that, that thing where you're like, am I, can I, if I don't ask, mm-hmm. I'm not going to get this. We had done a sketch on the regular season of Robot Chicken where the emperor gets a phone call from Darth Vader mm-hmm. after the Death Star is blown up. You did a couple of Emperor sketches. Yeah, but this one specifically was when Seth MacFarlane did the voice of the Emperor. Yeah. And the gag is that you only hear his side of the call. Yeah. And you see him telling I'm very it. familiar with this. Right, right, right. So yeah. Lucasfilm saw that mm-hmm. and they weren't mad about it. They were like, oh, this is funny. And mm-hmm. apparently George showed that sketch at a board mm-hmm. meeting and was like, this is funny. Yeah. And so they reached out to us and they were originally like, what do we do? Maybe it's... Um, interstitials for fan films, or maybe it's something like, maybe you guys make this kind of content for us. And uh, it was my partner who suggested that we do a half hour dedicated to Star Wars. Mm. Okay. And they were like, oh, interesting. And so they ran that up the flagpole until they agreed that it was possible and that we would work with them. And I'd already met George before, but not in the context of- Work. Work. Yeah. And so I had a good meeting with him. Um, I got invited to the- uh, prequel screenings at Skywalker Ranch mm-hmm. and went to the first and second one before I figured I had to get my head out of my ass and right. like d- be cooler because I had <laughs> you know asked George to sign my laminate right. and uh, and then at the second one I watched him just stand there as people after pe- person came up to him like sign this 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 and he didn't even have like conversations it was just he was a, th- a, a thing to be revered he was a and, thing yeah and so when I came back for the third one MTV asked me if I would walk him through the archives and uh, uh, interview him about the movie. And I was like, yes, mm-hmm. yes, I will. <laughs> and so I prepared myself. I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach him as a peer mm-hmm. and I'm going to try and find some commonality with him. And I said, oh, hey, George, I'm the guy who's going to be here asking the questions uh, for MTV. Is there anything you want to talk about or not talk about? And he's like, no, whatever you got. And I was like, okay, cool. I know you're probably doing the junket now. What's the question you're getting? Mm-hmm. What are they saying the most? Because you always get the one question where you're like, I, I've heard this question a million times. Really you have to does. pretend it's a brand new thing. And he was like, oh, it's about the integration of the CG, this and that. I'm like, well, I'll never ask you that. Don't worry about that. Mm-hmm. And then when we went and did the archive tour, he was real relaxed with me. So I worked to relax him even more. I tried to make him laugh. I asked him questions that I thought were interesting about stuff that he'd done 20 years ago. And then when, we, uh, then when I got to see him, to do our thing, he already had a sense of comfort with me. Mm. And so then I was able to be like, well, yeah, you're going to get on the mic and say this and right. give me like a louder version of that. Right. Yeah. It was, it was a trip, man. What was it like doing voice work on Clone Wars and Rebels? The best. It's yeah. the best because I love all that stuff. Right. And the, the cool thing is Dave Filoni, who uh, made Clone Wars, he and I just got to be friends mm. over all of these years. And so by the time they're... Um, they're putting those characters in the show. He's like, hey, you want to do this? And I'm like, yeah, just come do that. It's the best. Yeah. Yeah, I can't even take it. I've got like an action figure of the little droid that I play. (laughs) 
It's the who, best. What more could you ask for? What more could you ask for? Yeah. You could maybe do a show called Detours and do like mad episodes of it. This and guy. We never see it. <laughs> that well, maybe. Hey, stay. <laughs> listen, I'll see if we can. We'll stay. stay we'll, get, we'll, we'll try jump. We'll trade numbers afterwards. Okay. Okay. So I got one more Star Wars question. Then we're gonna move on. So it's, it's not fine. the Star I'm Wars gonna, podcast. I'm gonna do my due diligence and, and finally yes. after two years. Um, like I said, all the best. <laughs> Comedies do a, you know, Community got a Star Wars, yeah. you know, Family Guy, Star Wars. At one of the, at the end of one of the Family Guy, Star Wars, your character, Chris, challenges Seth's character, Peter, and Peter is dismissive yep. of Robot Chicken. Yeah. Was this based on anything real between you and McFarlane? Well, sort of, um, okay. but not really. We, um, <laughs> so we're both big Star Wars nerds, right. and we both make shows that we both work on. Right. Um, and then we both got the opportunity to make Star Wars at mm-hmm. the same time. Our production moved more quickly mm-hmm. than Fox, so we were able to air ours before theirs was finished. Okay, okay. And so that's really the joke, Okay. is that ours aired first. Okay. Mm-hmm. But... We wouldn't say anything about that. Right. And I didn't say anything about that. And I come in for a pickup, and there's this whole run uh-huh. between Peter and Chris. And I go, what is this? Right. And Seth said, well, you know, it'd be silly if we didn't acknowledge it. Right. <laughs> right and I right. was like, okay. <laughs> and then we went on to, like, d- take the piss out of each other, mm-hmm. which I just thought was very funny. It was great. So the more, it's just like Scott Evil, the more <laughs> sincere those moments seem, mm-hmm. the funnier it plays. Well, Chris right. became you. But yeah. still with the Chris voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was great. Well, well, I think that Seth Green is incredibly <laughs> yeah, yeah. prolific and, <laughs> and talented yeah. and, you know, robot chick, you know. It, <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was really very silly. So then they kept it up. And every time we made a new special, we just threaded that out even further. Right. Such a Beautiful. fun job. Yeah. Uh, you have so many projects that hit hard at Comic-Con. Uh, scared to ask almost, but what is your craziest experience there thus far? My craziest experience w- wasn't even at Comic Con. This is very funny. Um, I, my wife is from Memphis, and uh, their zoo is exceptional. And then they have a um, a local festival every year called the Zoo Rendezvous, where all of the local restaurants set up uh, booths all over the zoo, and at night you can walk through and try all the food from all around the place. And um, I went there. And it was incredible. Like, the food is so good, mm-hmm. plus the zoo and the atmosphere of people that want to be in a zoo eating food at night. It's a mm-hmm. really good vibe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, also, they have promotional peop- uh, co- uh, prom- people in promotional costumes okay. barking for some of the things. Okay. At one point, we're eating, and I see a six-foot taco <laughs> <laughs> running running towards me, screaming, Seth Green, Seth Green. <laughs> and I was like, oh no. And my wife turns to me, she goes, run. And I, and I run. And then the taco is chasing me, Seth Green, Seth Green. And I like duck behind a monkey cage or something. I lose, the taco runs past. I double back, back to the, uh-huh. and I was like, I think I lost him. <laughs> my wife tweets, um, hands down craziest thing I've ever seen is my husband running top speed from a six foot taco, screaming Seth Green at oh the zoo, zoo rendezvous. <laughs> There was a comment on that tweet that said, I was that taco. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry I got so excited. <laughs> I, hope, I hope nobody's mad. And That's we responded, funny. no, everything's cool. That's funny. Run, taco, run. We need to talk before you leave about how great the original film, Howard the Duck, is. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was a part of my childhood. Yeah. And just like... Like, boobies. That's what I think when I see that. Right off the top. Yeah. Too. They're like, this is a weird, dirty movie. Yeah. 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 Duck boobs. Duck boobs. Yeah. Duck boobies, which is even like, does this turn ducks on? You know, but you play. Duck nipples. Like, there's so many kinds. It was was anthropomorphizing duck breasts. Like, what are we? The whole thing felt strange. You played Howard the Duck. It felt like punk rock and super subversive to me. It was punk rock. Yeah. Um, And you played this in Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, Is that also you in What If? Yeah. Man, I really enjoy these what Me ifs. too. They're good. Did you ever read that book? Is? Were you ever into that book? No, I didn't know anything about it. I just it's came total, up on my Netflix or my Disney queue. It's a total side thing, but there's there's a series of issues of it. Mm. Um, and all of them are that. It's like, what if the Hulk fought Iron Man? And mm. like, you know, what if um, uh, 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 the Fantastic Four never, what if, what if it wasn't Peter Parker that was mm. bitten by the thing? What? It's all those stories. And so getting to see them done as animated is really cool. The animation yeah. is really excellent. Yeah. I'm like, okay, this is like high quality animation. They had, to, they had to send out for this. this it's a not- very specific type of like, it's not quite rotoscoping, but it moves uh, cinematically. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. Now, Changeland. Yeah. It's a beautiful film. Thanks, man. Um, I mean, it's just like a gorgeous postcard of a movie. I appreciate that. Um, it's really about 
transformation is you and Breck and Meyer. You guys have an incredible friendship that comes across on the screen. I got to ask you, is any of this stuff autobiographical? No, that's what's funny. Um, the, the true story of Changeland is that my buddy Dan and I went on a, a five-week trip uh, almost around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, 48 hours we spent in Thailand mm -hmm. was so cinematic mm -hmm. that I started taking pictures and taking notes. And I was like, I don't know what this is, but we're living in a movie. We're living in a movie. We're living in a movie. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have the dramatic circumstances to support it. Mm -hmm. But the things that we were experiencing, the connections between people the people that we met and the places we got to explore gave me such a vibe. I was like, I want to pass this on. No doubt. It's a beautiful piece of work. I encourage everybody to oh, check thanks, it out. man. I brought you um, a copy of our vinyl. This is like one of yeah, my proudest Yeah, you were telling things. me about this. It's the only record I've ever produced. And I love this. <laughs> and I appreciate this now. I got to share a story with you. Um, original score by Patrick Stump. Yeah. Patrick Stump is a friend of mine, a great musician. Yeah. And when I saw his name on the film, I was like, okay, I'm going to enjoy the music in this movie. And I really did. Patrick Stump and I got in the studio over a period of a couple of weeks. Maybe, maybe, what I want to say, 10 years? It's had to be 10 years ago. It was me, Patrick Stump, and Miguel. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know how this happened, but we made a bunch of songs. Producer from Germany, Farhat, made a beat. Patrick Stump sang to it, did a reference. Miguel embellished on his reference. And I rapped on it. And the version I put out is on my album, Fuck the Money, oh. which is on my website. And it's Patrick Stump and Miguel doing the hook together. And I'm, I don't remember the name of the song. But it's one of these songs. I got a lot of music. I'll track it down. Yeah. Uh, but definitely shout out to Patrick Stump. He got a, a lot to Google off of. He did some great work on here. Seth Green, what is up with you now? What's coming up next? Oh, my goodness. What can I, what can I even talk about? Tell us everything. Everything. I'm doing, everything. A, I'm doing a bunch of stuff. I put, um, you know, we, we have this uh, uh, animation and production studio. We make a bunch of different shows. Um, but I'm also um, putting a little more focus on uh, developing things for me to do on camera mm. or to direct. Yes. So that's really, I've got a bunch of things that I'm working on, but nothing that's ready to talk about. I'm going to come hop over your fence and get in some uh <laughs> No, we put things. a gate in, so it's easier <laughs> you to walk through. In? Yeah. Oh, when did y'all do that? <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> it, was before the, it was before the quarantine happened. Oh, you had to fully quarantine. You got to keep out those yeah. purge zombies, right? Yeah. Well, uh, Jeff Ross and I, Je my buddy Jeff Ross moved in. Uh, our, our our houses back up to each other. Mm -hmm. So there's a fence, but we put a gate in between. But, but he <laughs> yeah. would like, it'd be like, Jeff like, oh, you're coming over? And Seth's hopping <laughs> over the fence. And it's oh, like, yeah, the, okay. Originally, I had to climb over that fence. I was like, we got to put a gate in here. Sounds like a sitcom. It was. Yeah. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, Seth Green has been on a people's party and it's been such a pleasure to have you. My pleasure. Thank you for gracing us with your time and your Thanks energy. Thanks for having and me, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. This was awesome.